Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle, I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. A lot of you might have read in the news recently something saying that the Supreme Court has just said that you can't be stopped for impaired driving in your driveway. Or something saying that that recent TikTok video out of Ontario that I just covered is now not allowable uh, what the police did under the law. And I'm here to say that unfortunately the media's got this wrong in some big ways. So I'm going to try to explain what's going on, or at least sum up. So this is the case, and this is just recently out of the Supreme Court, of the King and McCollman. And basically what happens in this case is kind of interesting. So the police are out and about, and they spot this guy on an, on an ATV. And they follow him, and in their heads, just in their own thought process, they decide that they are going to uh, pull him over to conduct a random sobriety stop. They're just going to, they've got no particular reason to check this guy, but the law in Ontario allows for them to do that. And the reason why I say the law in Ontario is that this is very specific to Ontario's Highway Traffic Act. This gets to some very specific details about Ontario's Highway Traffic Act. So if you live in any other province, this case doesn't apply to you as much. So let's have a look sort of at what goes on there. So they decide that they're going to, you know, stop him. And that takes them a while to actually catch up with this guy. And by the time they do, when they finally stop him, he has pulled off the highway onto a private driveway. He's no longer on the road. He's now on this private driveway for his parents' house. And after stopping him, they then see signs of impairment. He's apparently clearly drunk. And they arrest him. They demand a breath sample. He's charged with impaired driving and with operating a motor vehicle uh, with an excess of 80 milligrams of alcohol in 100 milliliters of blood. All right. So that's our basic circumstances. Now, at the trial court level, he gets convicted because the trial court determines that the police did everything right and that was just fine. The summary conviction appeal judge, so he then appeals it up to the next level of court, uh, then says, no, um, this was improper because the police were not permitted to conduct a random sobriety stop on private property without reasonable and probable grounds. So based on that, he excludes the evidence. The trial court says that evidence can't be used at trial. And all of that evidence is, you know, the police's observation of him being intoxicated, as well as the, like, the breath test readings. So at that point, the guy's acquitted. So the court of, this gets appealed up to the court of appeal and the court of appeal dismisses the Crown's appeal and says that it's correct. So, um... The Crown then appeals this up to the Supreme Court. And then at the Supreme Court, we get things get interesting. So uh, ultimately, Mr. McCollman is convicted. But it's a long story to get there. So the reason why this becomes an issue is the particulars of the Highway Traffic Act in Ontario. So Section 48.1 basically says that the police can conduct random stops of drivers. Drivers is a very important bit of language here because not everyone is a driver. And so when we look at the actual Highway Traffic Act itself, uh, I'm just going to pull that up here. This, you'll see that driver, and in lots of my videos, I say you got to go to the definitions. Cases are won and lost on definitions. If you, if you want to understand what a statute means, you have to look at the definition. So driver means a person who drives a vehicle on a highway. And when you read something like that, you're going to want to look at other definitions for some of those words, because there's some critical words like vehicle and highway. And vehicle, I'm not going to be super worried about. Uh, vehicle is any kind of motor vehicle, trailer, traction engine, farm tractor, road building machine, bicycle, and any vehicle drawn, propelled, or driven by any kind of power, including muscular uh, power, but does not include a motorized snow vehicle or a streetcar. Um, so that's um, interesting. But uh, so vehicle doesn't help us a whole lot. But then when we go back and look at driver, we see that there's also highway, which is a critical word. And highway is where things go wrong for the government. 
Highway includes a common and public highway, street, avenue, parkway, driveway, square, place, bridge, viaduct, or trestle, any part of which is intended for or used by the general public for the passage of vehicles, and includes the area between the lat lateral property lines thereof. So, um, the problem that they run into here is that according to, again, Ontario's Highway Traffic Act, um, the highway would not include your private driveway because it's not intended for or used by the general public for the passage of vehicles. In fact, my driveway is for me and maybe my guests, but I don't like invite the public to drive on it or to park there or anything like that. It's just for me and people I specifically allow. So that's the problem, is that this guy is not really a driver on a highway if he's on private property. Okay, now the Crown also said, listen, there's another argument here. You know, even if he's now not on the, you know, not on the highway and can't be targeted under this section, well, the police formed the idea of pulling him over while he was still on the highway. And so that means that we should be okay because, you know, we're instead of this time being the moment when they actually pull him over. And what I mean by actually pull him over here is they turn on their sirens or they, you know, something, something to signal this guy that he's actually got to stop. That's sort of the, what I would think is the critical moment, but the government argued that the critical moment is the instant the cop has this idea between their ears. And to me, that seems just not only wrong, but also really difficult to navigate. Because how would you ever determine when the cop formed the idea other than just based on what the cop told you, right? Um, that seems like it's really going to be open for abuse. So the Supreme Court, um, and I think quite properly, said that no, the critical moment is not when the officer forms the idea. It's actually when the cop, you know, turns on their siren or if they yelled out with a bullhorn or I don't know, something. They have to actually communicate the desire to stop. That is, I think, quite correct. And they also said that this law doesn't include, and again, it's this law, your local province might have a different rule. And I suspect that one of the consequences of this is it would not surprise me at all if we see Ontario update their laws to say, now we're allowing this. They didn't say that a law can't allow this. They just said that this particular law didn't. And therefore the officers lacked any statutory authority for the stop. All right. Now, McCollman at this time was fairly drunk. Uh, he apparently had a strong odor of alcohol. He was apparently unable to stand up straight. And he told the officer that he might have had 10 beers that evening. Well, um, talking to the police is a bad idea. Talking to them about how you might hypothetically have had 10 beers is also a really bad idea. Um, they brought him to the police station to provide a breath sample and he threw up. So also kind of often a sign of intoxication, but they eventually conducted two tests, which were again, delayed because he was vomiting and uh, he blows 120 and 110 milligrams of alcohol and 100 milliliters of blood. They use the lower of those two ratings. So the 110 is the one that uh, stands and yeah. So based on all of this, the, the court concludes that Mr. McCollman's rights were violated and that the evidence that was taken was taken in violation of his rights. Now in the U S that would be the end of the inquiry at, at that point, they would say, listen, you've, you got this evidence through violating this guy's rights. So he's, you know, he's got to walk. It's, this is not fair. You violated his rights. You don't get to use that evidence. That is not how Canada does things. Canada actually has a further step, which is okay. Sure. You violated his rights, 
but maybe we're just going to allow the evidence in anyway. This is a an analysis that's conducted under 24.2 of the charter, and so this is um, this is a bit of a problem for Mr. McColeman because this is where things go wrong. There are a this is a multi-step process in terms of evaluating this, and this looks at. I'm just going to pull this up here. So we look at three stages. So first, the seriousness of the charter infringing state conduct. Is it really serious or is it kind of technical or, you know, and as a technical breach, you might think of something like, um, hey, we've we've got a warrant for this house. Um, it says that we're, you know, we're not allowed to go in until 8 a.m. And the officer, because he forgot to set his watch properly, accidentally goes in at 7.58. So two minutes early because his watch was incorrect, but he meant to wait until 8 a.m. That's kind of a, a technical breach, right? That might be not viewed as, as serious. Um, whereas the most serious kinds of breaches would be something like the officer intentionally, um, like the officer applied for a warrant to search your house. The officer was denied the warrant to search your house. And the officers searched it anyway, um, knowing that they didn't have a warrant, but just really, really wanting to. That would be very serious uh, infringements. Uh, the impact of the breach on the charter protected interests of the accused. So how, how serious is this in terms of the level of protection, right? Like a strip search is a more invasive and a more, um, has a higher impact than say searching your pockets as sort of an example and three society's interest in the adjudication of the case on its merits and that's where we're going to spend some time talking about that one in particular so this is kind of a balancing act and the courts have to evaluate all three lines and so in this case in terms of the seriousness of the uh the charter infringing conduct they note that you know the Police had, this is a question of whether the police conduct uh, involves misconduct from which the court should be concerned to dissociate itself. And the court must situate that conduct on a scale of culpability. Ultimately here, they conclude that this is, um, this is a, a factor that they say pulls slightly in favor of exclusion. They say, although there was relevant case law to support the pre police officer's sobriety stop, Given the legal uncertainty that existed at the time, the police officers should have acted with more prudence. When faced with legal uncertainty, the police would do well to err on the side of caution. I like this reasoning because uh, this says that the police can't just say, oh, well, there's cases that go for us or against us, so we're just going to assume that we have the most power that we possibly can. They note, at the time of the random sobriety stop, the applicable case law was in a state of uncertainty. And this is probably part of why, you know, the Supreme Court is interested in all this. But um, so they pointed to several Ontario cases in support of the, uh, the notion that there was jurisprudence that supported the officer's authority to make the stop on the shared driveway. But not all of it supported it. And ultimately... The, uh, that case law is wrong, right? All of that case law now is thrown out because the Supreme Court has given a contrary ruling. Now, I don't really find that the that this is all that persuasive. And the reason why is because um, if you or I get the law wrong, we're held 100% to the standard of it. Um, if I am wrong as to what the law says about how I store my guns, um, I get to go to jail for that and, you know, get firearm prohibitions and all sorts of nasty consequences. Why should the police get the benefit if they are wrong when everyone else gets punished for it? So here, ultimately, they say that the police officers had a duty to act cautiously and to question the limits of their authority. And so therefore, uh, this, they say this weighs slightly in favor of exclusion because they didn't actually have the power. Cool. Um, that's not a bad place to be. The impact on the breach of the charter protected rights. So here they say that this one weighs um, a little more strongly in favor of exclusion because at this point, the police are stopping him without statutory authority. 
um, which we don't like, right? We don't like to be detained by the police when they don't have the power to do so. Um, they're doing it on, you know, on a private residence. It wasn't his residence, but it's his parents' residence. So theoretically, that's kind of a place that you should expect to be uh, protected from, you know, interference or molestation or anything like that. And the police obtained significant evidence from doing so, including all of the stuff I mentioned, like the things where they see him being drunk, uh, the statements that they got from him, and ultimately the results of the two breathalyzer tests. So they say that this is a pretty big intrusion on his charter protected interests. Now, I already said he gets convicted, right? So you might be thinking, wait, given all that you've said, how does he get convicted? And then we get to this part, society's interest in the adjudication of the case on its merits. And here they say basically that the evidence that they've got is fairly reliable evidence in the sense that it's, um, you know, it's a breathalyzer that's fairly reliable. Uh, but they also really hang their hat on the seriousness of the offense. And they say uh, impaired driving is a serious offense and... They note, every year, drunk driving leaves a terrible trail of death, injury, heartbreak, and destruction. From the point of view of numbers alone, it is a far greater impact on Canadian society than any other crime. In terms of the deaths and serious injuries resulting in hospitalization, drunk driving is clearly the crime which causes the most significant social loss to the country. So, because of that, they say we're that this pulls strongly in favor of inclusion, and then when they try to balance these factors, they say, listen, um, we're going to allow the evidence in. So they agree that Mr. McCollman had his rights violated, but ultimately the evidence goes in. He gets no remedy. There is nothing. There is no cure that he gets for his rights being violated other than the fact that maybe he gets to say, hey, the Supreme Court said my rights were violated. He will have spent, assuming that this was, you know, him paying it on his own way, um, probably, you know, I, it wouldn't surprise me if this was a hundred grand that he's dropped on fighting this. Um, and, you know, of his, if assuming he's paying his own way on this, a hundred grand, and at the end of the day, they say, we violated your rights and you're still convicted anyway. That's not got to be super satisfying. I mean, you might want to wonder, hey, why would anyone go to the Supreme Court if the Supreme Court is ultimately going to say, hey, your rights were violated, but we're letting the evidence in anyway. Um, they talk about the, uh, you know, the confidence that the public would have in this. I'm not sure that the confidence of the public is supported here. I think that the public is going to be concerned. They mentioned the important public policy concerns about the scourge of impaired driving. Well, what about the important public policy concerns about police officers overstepping their authority? That's something that I think the public is more and more concerned about. So why doesn't that pull in our favor here? Uh, what is the lesson here? If police, you know, they say that police should be erring on the side of caution. Well, why would they? when the evidence goes in anyway why wouldn't they instead just say you know what we don't know where the law is but supreme court's probably got our back they're probably going to let the evidence in anyway i'm not happy with this kind of thing i don't like um how we tend to approach this especially because you know impaired driving they describe it as super serious but courts typically don't consider it as the most serious offense uh what if the charge is a murder most people think murder is higher than an impaired driving where nobody was killed. And I mean, that isn't to forgive it or anything like that, but nobody died here. So this is, um, this is a bit of a concern here. I'm not super happy with this. Now, ultimately, what is the impact of this going to be? Well, if you don't live in Ontario, the actual effects of this interpretation of Ontario law may or may not have any relevance to you whatsoever. 
if you do live in Ontario, it would not surprise me at all if ultimately they change the law to eliminate this particular concern or this particular sort of the thing that let this particular individual get acquitted and then ultimately convicted by the Supreme Court. So all of this to me is, um, you know, that part is not super significant in the long run. What is going to be more significant in the long run is the Supreme Court's analysis on evidence going in. And I suspect what you're going to find is more situations where the police have violated somebody's rights and the evidence goes in anyway. And so that rights violation ultimately means nothing. Not to the police, not to you, not to anybody. And effectively, those rights um, stop mattering at that point. Because if the evidence is going to go in anyway, why would the police care if they're violating your rights? Why would you be feel protected by that right if it's not going to stop any if it's not going to stop the police from doing the thing and it's not going to protect you if you ultimately go into court. So I don't like this decision. Uh, lots of people said, Hey, aren't you going to be thrilled by this decision? No, not, not at all. I'm, I'm exactly the opposite. And if we look at the TikTok case out of Ontario, the one I just recently covered, well, um, this wouldn't do a single thing for him because in that case, the police weren't randomly, uh, sort of stopping him, or at least they didn't say that they were, they didn't invoke those powers. Instead, they were stopping at his door as part of a specific and targeted thing because they thought that they had reasonable and probable grounds. So it doesn't seem to apply to protect him at all. And you can still face the situation of getting charged based on having drank after driving or on the police investigating you at your home. They just can't do it under this specific section of Ontario's specific law. Yay. All right. Well, now that I've been depressing, um, so thank you guys for watching. Please like this video. Uh, liking this video, by the way, does not indicate that you like the law. It just indicates that you enjoy having things explained to you. And, you know, hopefully that this was a useful explanation. Uh, share this with your friends because unfortunately there's been a lot of bad information going around about this one and I'm trying to correct it as best I can. And um, yeah, subscribe if you'd like to see more, you know, have more explanations, even though they're sometimes depressing. That's kind of my brand sometimes. Um, also, if you're interested, check out Roll of Law because uh, that's my sort of companion channel where I talk uh, sort of geeky things because on the Roll of Law channel, I have a giveaway right now. Um, it is sort of specific to that channel, but I am giving away um, 10 silver maple coins. So just like this one, uh, each one is an ounce of uh, uh, pure silver and they're all going together. So somebody's going to win 10 silver coins. Um, check that out if you have any interest. All right. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, the CCFR, Canada's National Firearms Association, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. At the $30 level, Sights and Arms Limited, Jane Baven Luxor, and Dave, uh, David Michaud. And at the $20 level, Lindsay Metcalf, Kyle Fox, Haywire, Gerald to the Bailey, Cameron Johnson, Andrew Elsich, and Vicky. Thank you as well to my $10 supporters who will be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge. See you next time.